It's Monday, July 30. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom. The state of public emergency now in effect in St. James will continue for another three months until November 1. Members of the Senate during Friday's sitting unanimously approved the extension. The state of public emergency was declared in St. James on January 18 by Prime Minister Andrew Holness and has been extended twice since then. Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Senator Pernell Charles Jr., who moved the resolution, said the state of public emergency is not intended to continue forever, but the extension is needed. Mr. President, the indisputable fact is that there has been a reduction in crime. This week we noted a release from the Jamaica Constabulary Force indicating that the police seized eight firearms and over 350 rounds of ammunition in less than 36 hours. Minister of Education, Youth and Information, Senator Ruel Reed, says the tertiary education system is being restructured in order to meet the demands of the 21st century and beyond. He said the objective is to better enable the sector to lead the way in positioning the rest of the education system to prepare for the future, as well as retrofitting and realigning its programs to meet the needs of the labor market over the short and long term. Addressing the University Council of Jamaica's strategic planning retreat last week, he informed that a draft policy has been prepared, outlining the necessary steps towards the establishment of a higher education commission, which will provide oversight of the sector. The National Works Agency, NWA, says there is a shortage of asphalt severely impacting road work across the island. NWA Acting Manager, Communications and Customer Service, Ramona Lawson, says Petrogem had indicated that it was working overtime to get things back on track. While not explaining the reason behind the shortage, she said the NWA is in constant dialogue with asphalt providers. Lawson said Petrogem, Jamaica's sole petroleum refinery, provides some of the raw materials used to make asphalt. The communications manager was responding to a National Water Commission press release in which the company said that it was not able to reinstate several roads because of the current shortage of asphalt. The NWC said that more than 3,400 square meters of road reinstatement had already been done by the NWA on behalf of the company in Kingston, St. Andrew, and St. Catherine at a cost of approximately $10 million. The police high command is cautioning motorists against installing and using flashing lights or sirens on their vehicles. The warning comes ahead of the launch of what high command says is a new phase in public order, safety and traffic management, which will see stricter enforcement of all aspects of Road Traffic Act, among other things. As such, motorists who have modified their vehicles with flashing lights and sirens are being urged to remove them immediately. The police high command is reiterating that, aside from being illegal, the lights also confuse members of the public, as well as engender apathy towards devices by emergency vehicles. In the meantime, drivers of public passenger vehicles with tints that are darker than allowed by the law will also be targeted by the police during this heightened phase. Jamaica's international development and diplomatic partners have commended the government on efforts being made to combat trafficking in persons and have committed to continuing to support the fight locally. Head of the European Union delegation, Molgatsa Walwuska, in noting the important steps being taken to eliminate the scourge, encouraged increased vigilance and called on citizens to report suspected cases of human trafficking. Jamaica and European Union signed an agreement for an additional grant of 20 million euro uh, or approx approximately 3 billion Jamaican dollars from the European uh, Union to advance its effort to increase citizen uh, security and to tackle crime and insecurity in the country. 
She was speaking at the two-day National Task Force Against Trafficking in Persons International Human Trafficking Conference last week at Melia Braco Hotel in Trelawney. About 2 million children are exploited every year in global sex trade, trade, which is just one area of human trafficking. Delegates explored the vulnerability of children being forced into modern-day slavery. They discussed sustainable strategies on how to save victims and prevent these atrocities. The conference was highly interactive, with 72 recommendations set to inspire further action. Delegates hailed the event a success. It's been a, it's been a, a wealth of information given um, on this conference. I am just overwhelmed, and I'm really overwhelmed in a positive way. And I'm so grateful to have been able to be a delegate of Westchester County to come down and experience this. I think it was a very rewarding conference, and I think what is most rewarding and valuable about it is that different stakeholders came together to give contributions from their perspectives, and the result of that as well is that they learned from other perspectives. So for me as a prosecutor, I learned so much about investigations, I learned so much about faith-based organizations and the role that they and others play in the fight against trafficking. Inside, during the question and answer, you, you, you made some interesting points in terms of the role of the, the health workers and how can they contribute to, to the fight against human trafficking. Can you reiterate that, please? So basically, in a nutshell, what I was saying was that traffickers, they, they value secrecy, they value hiding, they want their victims to be unknown as victims. But, that, but when, 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 when there is abuse and there are elements of physical violence, which is a hallmark or a feature of trafficking in many cases, those physical marks of violence, they can diminish the value, so to speak, of the commodity, which is the victim. So they allow the victims to go to see doctors. And so healthcare professionals, persons who work in the medical industry, they have a very, very unique role to play because they are the ones who can actually see elements, um, signs of trafficking, and they can be alerted to it and alert the authorities in the meanwhile. I'm here working uh, in a joint effort with Jamaica, learning a lot about human trafficking. Okay, so what are your thoughts on the conference so far? Oh, this conference has been beautiful. A lot of sharing of information. I learned a lot. We were able to provide some information that we've had on dealing with the same subject matter in Westchester County. And I, I think we can really grow and evolve. It's been absolutely fabulous. I've uh, learned a lot because as you see, we have, this is an international conference. So it's nice to hear from different agencies such as Interpol, uh, see what they do here in Jamaica. And we all take these ideas back home and they can be integrated into what we do as well. Okay, so you, have you worked um, with, with our, our, our police force on in general, on human trafficking? Yes, uh, we've worked, and in the United States, uh, we work very closely with our federal agencies, with the FBI, being that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm home-based in New York. However, trafficking is, uh, it, it's all over the United States. So we partner there, and as well as uh, many, the, uh, many of the people being trafficked, trafficked in the United States are international. So we have to work with our international organizations to combat this uh, the scourge of human trafficking across the globe. In her remarks, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Justice, Carol Palmer, said that the International Human Trafficking Conference must be seen as a call to action for Jamaica. We need help. We need help from everyone, all groups, all categories, and very especially the media to go into the nooks and crannies of Jamaica, up in the hills up there that I've never been from I was born, right? And across the island to speak with our people, to help them to appreciate this grave crime. The Justice Ministry, which organized the conference, said the fight against human trafficking should be significantly bolstered through the event and marks another milestone in its efforts to spot them, stop them, report them. The focus of the National Task Force Against Trafficking in Persons based in the ministry. President of the Jamaica Agricultural Society, Norman Grant, says all is in place for the 66th staging of the Dembe Agriculture Industrial and Food Show. 
The annual event will be held on the Denby Showground, Maypen Clarendon, August 4 to 6, under the theme, Grow What You Eat, Eat What You Grow, Agriculture, Securing Our Future. Patrons will be able to purchase fresh produce from the farmer's market over the three days. There will be competitions for national champion farmer, livestock and champion youth in agriculture. In regional news, we look to Cuba. Our Caribbean neighbors recently celebrated National Rebellion Day. Richard's Richard has the highlights and explanation for the recognition of July 26, 1953 as a significant day in history for Cubans. Cubans celebrated National Rebellion Day as a homage to all dead and living heroes who assaulted the Moncava and Carlos Manuel de Céspedes garrisons the 26th of July 1953 in the eastern part of the island. More than 10,000 local residents in representation of the whole country attended the celebration on the grounds of the former Moncada barracks in Santiago de Cuba, where 65 years ago, Fidel Castro Rus and a group of young people attacked the military troops of the most criminal and bloodthirsty regime that had ever existed in the island. Although the action was a military failure and many of the assailants were tortured and brutally murdered, it paved the way for the victory of the revolution five years, five months and five days later. Es palpable el entusiasmo de los santiagueros Y de toda la provincia. The main address for the celebration of National Rebellion Day was delivered by Raúl Castro, first secretary of the Cuban Communist Party, who called on all Cubans to be on the alert amidst the new hostility stage of the Trump's administration, with the reinforcement of the extraterritoriality of the United States blockade, the increase of aggressiveness in public statements given by North American officials on Cuba. Furthermore, the former president called on the Cubans to be watchful against those who consider that it is time to destroy the example coming from Cuba. He also pointed out that this will not be the first nor the last time that the Cuban revolution has to face threats. We have endured, he said, all sorts of risks and have successfully resisted for 60 years. Raúl Castro reassured that Cuba is a peaceful and friendly country that represents no threat to no one. However, he highlighted, the Cuban people is willing and prepared to fight back in order to achieve victory if anyone dares to attack the country. Evaluating current challenges faced by progressive forces in Latin America and the Caribbean, Raúl Castro expressed the Cuban people's solidarity with the governments of Venezuela and Nicaragua, and demanded the release from prison of former Brazilian president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, current presidential candidate of the Brazilian Workers' Party. Reclamamos la libertad del compañero Lula da Silva y su derecho a ser el candidato presidencial del Partido de los Trabajadores, como exigen constantemente miles de brasileños y numerosas organizaciones del mundo. The celebration of National Rebellion Day comes at a special moment for Cuba, marked by a change in the leadership of the state and government with the arrival of Miguel Díaz-Canel in the presidency last April and the totally reformed constitutional project that will be put to public consultation from the coming 13th of August until the 15th of November, before its final approval by the Cuban Parliament. Direct from Cuba, Richard Richards, Canal Caribe. In sports, Travis Michael won Jamaica's first track and field medal at the Central American and Caribbean Games when he took the bronze medals in the men's discus throw over the weekend with a mark of 64.68 meters at Roberto Melendez Stadium in Colombia. And after a long struggle with Achilles heel tendons, Double sprint medalist in the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, Elaine Thompson has pulled out of competition for the rest of the 2018 season. With World Championships and Olympic Games up ahead in 2019 and 2020, the 26-year-old native of Banana Ground, Manchester, will now concentrate on returning to full fitness. 
Next year, the IWAF World Championships will take place in Doha, Qatar, while the 2020 Olympic Games are set for Tokyo, Japan. And that's the news. Thanks so much for watching PBCJ. I'm Simona Absalom. Pleasant viewing.